Well, good morning, Foothill. Why don't you stand to your feet this morning? If you're outside, come on in, grab a seat. We're going to start with some singing. Declare our love for Jesus Christ and our hope and faith in Him this morning. Let's sing it, our scars. Our scars are a sign of grace in our lives. And Father, how you brought us through. But deep were the wounds, and dark was the night. The promise of your love you proved. And now every battle still to come. Let this be our song. It is well. You sing it, church. It is well with my soul. Joy is in Christ. Let's sing it, weeping. Weeping may come, remain for a night, but joy will paint the morning sky. You're there in the fast, you're there in the feast. Progress will always shine. But now every place sing still to come let this be honest declare it is well you sing it, church it is well with my soul with my soul and it begin by singing this, declaring this, that at all times, in all seasons, through all trials, through every blessing, that we declare our trust and faith and hope in God. Let's declare it, it is well. And it is well, you sing it. It is well. With my soul. With my soul. 
why we sing church one of the reasons we sing is just to remind ourselves remind ourselves of the goodness of Jesus that we can count on him at all times through everything as we sing this song declaring our trust and hope in Jesus this morning church let's do that say you are you are who you say you are with faith we can sing this you'll do you'll do what you say you'll do you'll be who you've always been to us jesus yes. we declare that he's our hope and our hope is in you alone our strength in your mighty name our peace in the darkest day remains Jesus we can declare this is what we know and this we know that we will see the enemy right this we You are unfailing. Amen. He's our God. And our God through the wilderness. Our joy in the heaviness. Church, He's our joy today. He's our way. And our way when it seems there is no way. Jesus. Church, let's put our hope and our faith in Him alone. This we know. This we know. We will see the enemy ride. This we know. That we will see the victory come. As we hold on to every promise you ever made. Jesus, you are our failing. And we say these words as our hope in Him that we trust. But we trust You. We trust You. For Your ways are higher than our own. We know. We trust. We trust You. We trust You. For Your ways are higher than our own. Church, let's lift our hands and just declare this to Him. That we trust you, yes, we trust you, for your ways are higher than our own. We trust, we trust you, in all things we trust you, for your ways are higher than our own, for this we you 
church is so good for us just to remind ourselves of God's trustworthiness and that we can put our hope in Him. No matter what we face, no matter what lies ahead, that our trust can and should be placed in Jesus Christ. So let's declare we trust. And we trust you. We trust you for your ways are higher than our own. Your voice is just singing. We trust you. We trust you. Your ways are higher than our own. We trust. Yes, we trust. time we put our hope in him we trust you we trust you your ways are higher than our own church we're going to keep singing and worshiping the God who's given it all for us. And as you stand there this morning, let's reflect on what Christ has done for us, the cross and what he gave up for us. up his name.
we thank you. We thank you so much for the shed blood of Jesus this morning. And God, the reason why we gather here, the reason why we sing these songs and, and lift your name on high is because of what you did for us through your son. And God, we just can't help but be grateful and in awe and, and worshipful because of all that you've done for us, Lord, and all that you continue to do for us. God, thank you so much for your good character, your good nature, and your love for your children. God, we worship you for it. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, all welcome to Foothill Church. We are so glad you're here with us this morning. Adults, go ahead and grab a seat. And uh, kids, kindergarten through fifth grade. Any kids, kindergarten through fifth grade, go ahead and head out. We have a great program for you today. Uh, junior high, high school students, glad to have you here with us as well. And uh, welcome to Foothill. We're glad you're here with us for our 11 a.m. service. Uh, my name is Stephen. I'm one of the pastors here on staff. And uh, great to have you here at church. Uh, just a couple of things for... Uh, so, man, uh, a couple of things for us this morning as we jump in, especially if you're new with us. Uh, here's kind of a, a little bit of what we're about right off the bat, so you don't have to kind of wonder. Uh, we exist to glorify God by leading people into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ rooted in the gospel. That's our, that's our mission as a church. That's what we are about as a church. And, uh, and uh, it's kind of everything you see on a Sunday, everything midweek, all our ministries are kind of through that filter of seeing people grow in their relationships with Jesus. And so just for you to be aware of first time guests especially. Uh, but if it is your first time, I want to encourage you, uh, first time guests or second time guests, or if you've never just done this before, uh, take this orange and white connection card out as I'm talking, should be in the seat back in front of you, and I'd love for you to write your name and your email address on it, at the very least. You can fill the whole thing out if you want to, but uh, name and email would be great, and just let us know it's your first time. Uh, on the back side, there's an area for a prayer request. We'd love to be able to know how to pray for you specifically, um, how to be able to lift up uh, your request. It'd be our honor to do that. We gather each uh, Thursday as a staff to, to pray for these requests. Um, just last week, me, uh, me and my prayer buddy, uh, Daniel Kaler, our facilities manager, we were praying for some cards. And it was just good to be able to kind of say these requests out loud and to be able to, uh, to, to just be able to pray over these. And so if, if you'd let us, it'd be our honor to do that, just to pray for your needs. Uh, so make sure you write those requests on the back. Uh, but first time guests, you're going to hang on to this card until the very end of service. You're going to walk out to the black info tent. That's right, that, that tent in between those two buildings, the two areas, our kids' area and the sanctuary area. Um, and you're going to hand, hand this card to our volunteers. And when you do that, they have a gift for you just for uh, following directions. If it's your first time, we'd love to be able to meet you out there and answer questions you may have at the black info tent all right um, also first time guests um, I want to invite you also there's a, a class called foothill 101 that we hold the first Sunday of, of each month it's actually happening right now during service uh, happened all morning in all four services and uh, if, if you have not attended that class or if you're new to the church want to know more about what we're about our history the staff kind of overviews and ministry overviews and really an invitation to you to start our growth track process um, I want to encourage you to attend that class. You can RCP on your connection card and um, attend next uh, next month, the first Sunday next month. Uh, so I encourage you guys to do that as well. All right. Well, and last thing, there's the service opportunity catalog on your seat. Um, as I'm talking, pull this out. And many of you are already serving. Actually, just by a show of hands, how many of you are already volunteering with a service team here at Foothill Church? Raise them high. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Great. Thank you so much for serving. Thank you for volunteering, for giving up uh, more of your time, uh, more of your, your, uh, your, your Sunday to serve with the church. And, and here's the thing. We have a lot of people serving, but we also have a lot of other opportunities for people who are not serving uh, to jump in and do that. So if you are new to the church, uh, serving is a great way for you to meet people. It's a great way for you to exercise um, our, our value as Christians to serve as well, to serve people around us. Many of you are sitting in the seats today that you're in because somebody served you on the way in. Somebody served you coffee. Somebody helped you find a space uh, to park in. And so there's a lot of ways where people are watching your kids right now. Um, there's lots of ways where you can be volunteering to, to help as well. So look through this catalog. Find a place um, where it works for your family and yourself to, to start serving volunteering in a meaningful way here at Fiddle Church and uh, I, I promise you won't you won't be sorry you did so if you uh, want to do that again back to this card simply just check the box I'm interested in serving and then write the area where you want to volunteer and we'll get back to you very early this week with some next steps 
All right. Well, I want to ask the ushers just to get ready for our time of giving and an offering. And if, if uh, you call Fiddle Church your home church, um, go ahead and get ready for that as well as we as we tithe and, and give back to God what is His. Uh, but I just want to encourage us uh, this morning to reflect back on God's goodness. And this is something that I know that it's, it's kind of easy to forget, right? We kind of just go through our week, we kind of think about the things we have to do. And we sometimes don't realize, don't remember that it was God who gave us everything to start with. And, and part of why we pause and why we kind of um, are intentionally kind of talking through this tithing each week is because we want to do that. We want to remember that all good gifts come from our Father who is in heaven, and He's the one who gives those gifts. And so when we give, it's an act of worship, a way for us to respond in, in worship back to Him. Um, you'll hear more about kind of what we give towards in just a minute. There'll be a video, actually, of, uh, about um, a missionary that we support that you'll have a chance to hear more from later. But um, here's how you give if you've never done that before. There's this offering envelope in the seat back in front of you. It looks just like this. And you can drop cash or check in the envelope and drop the bucket that passes by. Um, you can also go online, thefiddlechurch.net slash give, and find out more about giving there, set up recurring gifts. And uh, you can always pull out your smartphone and text 45777 and, and uh, start giving via your smartphone as well. It's always a very easy way to give. Um, so even if you're not here on a Sunday, that's always an option for you. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's bow our heads. Let's uh, thank God for the gifts he's given us. And um, let's worship him through this time. Lord, we, we thank you. Uh, we thank you for your goodness to us. And we thank you that as... As even person, as I look back at this week, how you provided for, for, for our family in big and small ways. And I just am so grateful, Lord, for your provision. And so, God, I pray that as we give back to you during this time of offering, during this time of, of tithing, Lord, uh, that we would do so with a grateful heart, uh, realizing that you love us and that you care for us so much more, Lord. I pray this all in your name. Amen. I'm Daryl McCarthy and I serve with the European Leadership Forum and uh, since 1988 I've been serving with Christian professors who were teaching in secular universities around the world. Europe is spiritually the darkest continent in the world. It's the most lost continent, the most desperately hard to reach as well. In spite of all these massive symbols of Christianity that if you're a tourist you see as you travel across Europe, you've got the massive cathedrals, you've got all the thousands of Christian masterpieces of art. But unfortunately, very few Europeans have ever heard the good news of forgiveness through Jesus Christ. The goal of the European Leadership Forum is to equip and to train leaders all across Europe to build the biblical church and to re-evangelize Europe. And so every year, hundreds of leaders gather and scores of ministry come together to equip leaders to be in love with Jesus, to be people of prayer, to engage in persuasive evangelism, to engage in deep discipleship of new believers. You know, the university is where the gatekeepers of a culture are trained. Over 95% of all world leaders are trained in the university. If we are serious about Christ and His righteousness and His justice impacting not just souls, but all the arenas of law and politics and government and media and entertainment and education and the home, then we must be engaged with the university. We're wanting to see the lives of Christian academics all over Europe changed. And as we do this, we need your support through prayer. We also need financial support. We're needing over $200,000 each year. So we're grateful for the opportunity to serve with the European Leadership Forum in partnership with the biblical church as we seek to re-evangelize Europe in this generation. Pastor Chris, one of the pastors around here. It's good to see you all here. And uh, Daryl is actually a longtime friend of Michelle and myself, our families. We've been supporting him as a church, he and his wife, for a number of years now. And, um, 
and he is a part of something called the European Leadership Forum, as you saw. And I, I want to encourage you, he's, he's here today. Um, he's not here because he's kind of going back and forth between campuses. But he'll be out in the lobby afterward. And I just want to invite you to go talk to him. If anything about this sort of resonated with your heart, I mean, you love kind of the university, you love academia, you, you, you love the strategic importance of training those kinds of leaders um, for the future of the culture and the world. Uh, I want to encourage you to go talk to Daryl. Daryl's a great guy, and, and honestly, it's one of the most strategic ministries that we uh, we, 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 uh, we help support as a church. And, and my hope is that some of you actually would catch a vision enough where you'd say, you know what, I, I want to actually just be involved in this personally in some way. And so it's not, you know, hey, give us your money so we can give it to Daryl. Some of you may say, you know what, I just want to support them directly. And we are all for that. Like, like we would love to see him walk away from being at Foothill Church this, uh, this weekend with some personal supporters, the people that sort of stand behind the vision of European Leadership Forum. It's an absolutely incredible ministry, uh, you know, in the dark continent of, of Europe. And uh, I'm just grateful that guys like Daryl and others like him are there on the front lines really training uh, leaders for the future. So go see him, and uh, I, know, I know you'll love him. A great guy and a wonderful ministry, okay? Well, let's grab our Bibles, and let's open to, uh, to Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6. And we'll get there in a moment, but let me, let me just make sure we sort of get our footing and know where we are. We started this series called Bittersweet, the Good News of Redemption. And we've said this since day one. What we want to try to do is slowly unpack what the gospel is and then what the gospel does. You understand the gospel's not just this idea, this neat thing that Jesus died for us. It actually, it actually plays itself out in our lives over a lifetime as Christians. And so we started at week one and we said there's bad news because the gospel's good news and good news only invades bad spaces. And so we, we looked and said there's this bad news that you're a sinner by birth, you're a sinner by choice. The good news is that Christ came to redeem sinners. Christ comes, he, he conquers sin, hell, death, the grave, all of that. And you can be part of this by repenting of sin, turning in faith to Jesus Christ. And then last week, we sort of turned and said, okay, but what, what happens? What, what, there, there's more that comes with the gospel than simply, no, I'm forgiven of sins. And so we talked about these two amazing, glorious doctrines called justification and adoption. Justification, this legal declaration that you are no longer condemned, you are innocent, you are righteous, in fact. And then this... Uh, maybe more amazing is the idea that now the judge has pounded the gavel and said, you're righteous. I declare you righteous because I've declared uh, Jesus condemned. And you sort of swap places, if you will. But now the judge takes off his robe and says, I'm also a father and I want to adopt you. And he adopts us into his family and we become children of God with all that means, all the inheritance, all the blessing, all the joy of knowing that God is our father. Even if we got father issues, God is our father and he's the greatest father we can Im ever imagine. I mean, there's no human, no person on earth that ever compares to the fatherhood of God. So this is what we said. And that leads us into another doctrine I want to talk about today. And so we've called this sermon Sanctification and Anger. Now let me explain to you why such a strange title. Because today I at least want to start to flesh out. I want to deal with this doctrine of sanctification and what that means but maybe more importantly, I want you to see then how does it actually, how does this now, all this news of the gospel begin to intersect a very real part of every one of our lives. I don't know anybody that doesn't deal with anger in one form or another. It could be as, as extreme and hostile as abuse. It could be something that you sort of shove down and nobody knows, but it's there. So how does the gospel step into that bad news arena of our life with really good news, okay? So, so sanctification, let's start there and, and let's first ask, what is it? Let, let me give you a definition. Sanctification is the gracious work of God to make us holy, if you're a Christian, right? Holy like Jesus and our grace-driven effort to become holy like Jesus. Now notice... 
I want to make sure you don't misunderstand me. There is, there is something going on in sanctification, but what I want you to see out of this is not God plays his part, I play my part. I want you to see it's all of God. Because God is making us holy, but God is also giving us the grace to cooperate with what he's doing so that now there's this grace-driven effort, if we can call it that, to become holy. So the Bible says, Chris, if you're a Christian, it says to all of us, if you're a Christian, you are holy right now. But the Bible, without contradiction, will say, but you must become holy. And that's because positionally, I stand before God. He looks at me and says, because of what Christ has done, Chris, your sins are forgiven. You are holy. You are righteous. Now, Chris, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my spirit inside of you, and that Holy Spirit is now going to enable you. It's going to drive you, pull you, push you through my grace to become more holy. So, so Paul will say this in Philippians chapter 2, I think. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Now, now look at that. <clears throat> so it's all of God. God is at work in you. God is giving you a willingness. There's the grace driven. That's the cooperation. But I don't cooperation. I don't cooperate just sort of on my own. I decide that. No, God gives me the grace so that he enables me now to do this. So I am, I am holy, but I am becoming holy. This is, this is the whole idea of what's happening in sanctification. Okay, justification, adoption, this one-time act. Sanctification, this process by which I am growing in holiness. And this is what God wants for us. God wants us to grow. God expects that when he saves us, there's going to begin this process of growing us to be more and more like Jesus. Okay, so look at how Paul says it in Titus uh, chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness, worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. In other words, he doesn't say the grace of God appears, and boom, I am now perfectly godly. I never make mistakes. I got no worldly passions. I live perfectly self-controlled. No, I'm training. I'm learning. I'm being instructed. I'm growing. And all of us, right, in our training, it's something that we learn. Jesus learned obedience. I mean, this idea of I've got to learn this. Self-control is a lifetime of learning. Do you struggle with self-control? Welcome to the club. Because God is growing us, right? Slowly growing us to be more and more self-controlled as the grace of God works in our lives. So, so this, is, this is sanctification. So now I'm actually growing in holiness because a Holy Spirit dwells in me, leading me toward holiness. If the Spirit of God dwells in you, Paul says, there's going to be certain things that are true of you. There's going to be certain things that are not true of you. What you ought to see is there is a difference between the old man and the new man. And if there is no difference between the old man and the new man, then there is no such thing as a new man. You understand what I'm saying? If there is no, if you can look and say, God, there's been no change in my life since you saved me, then you're not a Christian. Because this is the witness, this is the testimony of Scripture from beginning to end. Not you're perfect. Not that Christians don't sin. The testimony of Scripture is that Jesus Christ will come and begin to grow you, and you will now love things you used to hate, hate things you used to love, do things you didn't want to do, not do things now that you, you, you didn't want to do then, I mean, or you did do then, right? You're, 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 you're parting from your former self. And so let me just show you a few examples. I, I had you open to Romans chapter 6, so let me just, I, I wish I could do this whole chapter with you, but this is just one part of Romans. I want to show you just a couple of them. Romans chapter 6, verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? What's the answer to Paul? We can't. 
That should not be. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him. There's our union with Christ by baptism and death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of God the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. In other words, if you have died, Paul says, if you have died with Christ, and you have if you're a Christian, and you've been raised with Christ, and you have if you're a Christian, then there ought to be a difference in your life. You will no longer continue in sin. So so much so that Paul will say in verse 14 that sin will have no dominion over you. That that is, is, you have a brand new operating system. There is something new. What will characterize you is not sin. What will characterize you is a turning from that. It will not be the governing authority in your life. Now turn over a couple of pages to to, uh, to Romans chapter 8 and verse 3. And look what Paul says there. For God has done, in the Christian this is, what the law weakened by the flesh, that is my own abilities, could not do. What did he do? By sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Why? In order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Now now look at me. This is what he just said. God redeems us. One of the things God does so that we might fulfill the law. The law might be fulfilled in us. The law is not this terrible thing. Paul's going to say, no, no, don't talk about the law like it's evil. By no means. The law is good and holy and righteous. The law simply provokes my sin, shows me what's wrong with me, and then I turn. And when I become a Christian, now I have a desire. I don't just obey the law because I'm told to. I want to. I want to please God. But now now keep going in in, in verse 5 of Romans 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on things of the Spirit. For to set the mind on the flesh is death, but to set the mind on the Spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So Paul goes and says, okay, look it. There's, if you set your mind on things of the flesh, you're not a Christian. If you set your mind on things of the spirit, you are. Now, what does this mean? I mean, I walk around only listening to worship songs and my Bible's always got to be open. I got to be reciting scripture in my head. I've got to be, you know, always saying God, 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 you know, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I've got to somehow just keep this on my mind. Is that setting my mind? No. No, in fact, um, That's not at all what it means. To to set your mind means something in your life has ultimate importance. What you set your mind on has ultimate importance for you. Your life is oriented around it. Now, hear me. Is that you when it comes to God? Is your life oriented around of God? Is, is God the thing, is he the one, is he the person that has ultimate significance in your life? Because the opposite of that is to set your mind on things of the flesh. And Paul says Christians won't do that. A Christian will not set his mind. That's going to lead to death. That's going to lead, that's leading you somewhere else, somewhere outside of God. The Christian will look and say, God is my ultimate significance. God is the one of ultimate importance. I set my mind on pleasing him, on walking him. Now, now what does it mean, though, when Paul says, we don't set our minds on things of the flesh? Like, like what? Like, I don't like ice cream? Because I love ice cream. I, I uh, you know, I, I, there's certain things I just can't do. Is there a bunch of, there's a bunch of like, um, I can't enjoy life. You know, I've got to be meditating on, no, no. What are these things of the flesh, these desires of the flesh that we're not to set our mind on? We'll go over to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5 and go down to verse 16. Now Paul's going to kind of describe for us and help us understand what does he mean by these things of the flesh that we're supposed to avoid. 
Verse 16, chapter 5 of Galatians. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Okay? I don't want to, I want to make sure I don't do that. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you're led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Okay, Paul. What are the things that you would put in this category of the flesh? Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If this is the pattern of your life, the pattern of your life is one that pursues sinful things. By the way, that's not an exhaustive list. He didn't say these are the only things. He's saying he's giving you these categories, if you will, internal sins, external sins, sexual, non-sexual, all these things that say these things will lead you to death. Do these Are these the patterns of your life? If they are, then you'll not inherit the kingdom of God. You're not a Christian, I guess is the way he would say it. But, verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Paul says this is it. This is what ought to characterize a Christian. You'll know a Christian by the fruit they bear. By the way, notice it is, it is the fruit, not the fruits of the Spirit. That's important. You know why? Because one of the things that you ought to see if you're a Christian is not that I bear a little bit of patient fruit over here and some joy fruit over there and some goodness under here and a little bit of you know, uh, gentleness up here. It's one fruit And you ought to, if you're a Christian, you ought to see every one of those at work in your life in some way. I'm not saying they're all just perfectly manifested. If they are, we're all doomed. I'm saying, here's why I say that, and this is important, because some of you are, you're, you're temperamentally joyful. That's just who you are. You're temperamentally gentle. You are just almost by nature just patient. That's, not, that's, not, that's, that's great. The Spirit of God comes along and says, yes, but are you also self-controlled? Are you also faithful? Right? Do, do all of these things, are you seeing all of these things come to bear in your life to one degree or another? Again, I, I know some of us are better at things than others, right? But we ought to see all of them uh, in our lives. Okay, so, so in other words, Paul's going, look, th- these are things that ought to be true of you if you're a Christian and things you ought not to do. You ought not to do these sins of the flesh, you ought to do the walk by the Spirit. And this is what it looks like. Now, let me give you one more. Go back to Colossians chapter 3, just a few pages over. You go Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and you get to chapter 3. And I, I, l- let me skip forward for now and just show you what I mean. Because what I'm trying to show to you from all of these passages is look at the difference that ought to be in the life of a Christian. That these things ought not to be happening in the life of the Christian. Verse 5 of Colossians 3, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. What's earthly? Sexual morality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. Look down at verse 8. Put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you put off the old self with its practices and put on the new self, which is being renewed after the image of its creator. I would go on, he goes down into verse 12, and he says, okay, now you've put off those things, put on those things. Okay, look, the most simple way I know how to say it, Paul is saying this, if you're a Christian, your life will reflect it. Your, it will be reflected in the way you think, in your motives, but it absolutely will be reflected in your behavior. That is not legalism. That's Christianity. That's, I'm, there's a difference in me. I'm walking differently. You should not be seeing things in my life. 
I should not be getting drunk on the weekend. I should not be sleeping with my girlfriend. I should not be doing all, I should not have obscene language coming out of my mouth. Oh, you're being legalistic. No, I'm being a Christian. Paul says this is the manifestation that, that, that what you say is true is actually true. See, you know, the Bible says, listen, the, the only evidence, how do you know you're a Christian? I know we ask this all the time, and a couple weeks ago we said, well, listen, have you repented and you put your faith in Jesus? And the Bible is going to say this, you know how you know if that was real? There will be fruit. You don't know that was real. See, you're not a Christian because you raised your hand at some crusade. You're not a Christian because you walked down some aisle. You're not a Christian even because you got baptized. You're not a Christian because you attend church a lot. You're not a Christian because you grew up in a Christian family. You're certainly not a Christian because you're American. You are a Christian and you can be confident because you look at your life and say the fruit is being born in my life. Listen to me, there will be a pull, there will be a push toward more holiness, not less. Christian, you will not say things. You might say this, but it will grieve you. You will not say how close can I walk to the edge and still call myself a Christian? You will say, I don't want to walk close to the edge. I want to be as close to Christ as I possibly can. And he's not walking anywhere near the edge. He's walking in perfect holiness. And I want to walk with him. That's a Christian. That's the impulse of a Christian. This is sanctification. This is God saying, walk with me. There will be a difference in your life. Now, what I want to try to explore a little bit is we, we talk about sanctification is God's at work in you to make you more holy like Jesus, but you're also, you're also responding to his grace through this, what we call grace-driven effort. Now, how do you do that? How, maybe say it this way, how do I cooperate with what God is trying to accomplish in my life to make me more like Jesus? How do I do that? What does it actually look like? So let me give you, let me give you, uh, I don't know, four for like h- how, how you do this, okay? And, and uh, just, just listen carefully. If you don't, don't get them down, that's okay. We'll put on the podcast. You can listen to it later. But let me, let me just give you a few things for you to think about. And I want us to stay in Colossians chapter three and see what Paul says. There's a lot of places we could go here, okay? We could go to Romans six. We could read the book of Romans, frankly. There's a lot of places. I just want us to camp here in Colossians three just for a minute to see how is it that we actually get involved in this grace-driven effort to become more like Jesus, okay? The first thing I want you to see is that you remember your story. So go to Colossians 3, verse 1. Now, I want you to see what Paul is doing here. Again, I'm, th- in some ways, I feel like I'm oversimplifying. And I, just, I only tell you this because I want you to, there's so much here, but I want you to see the progression of Paul's thought. Here's all he does. If then you have been raised with Christ... If you're a Christian, have you been raised with Christ? Yes, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things that are above, not on things that are, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Now here's all, again, here's what Paul is doing. Remember who you are. Remember what Christ has done for you. You have died with Christ. You've been raised with Christ. You're now hidden. Right now, you are hidden with Christ in God. You know why Paul does this? You know why we're supposed to do this all the time? You know why Paul says things like Galatians chapter 2? I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I live with Christ that lives in me. And the life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God. Why does Paul constantly, constantly return to the cross? Why does he constantly return to the burial and the resurrection of Jesus? He's reminding himself, he's reminding us, and we must remind ourselves who we are in Christ. I told you last week, and this is true of all of us, we live out of our identity, always. And your new identity in Christ is the primary impulse toward purity. It is the primary driving motivation toward holiness. 
Paul's saying, I do not want you to forget who you are. Remember, and remember your, your story. This is what God did for you. Reckon this to be true. Listen, this is why, this is why, hear me, this is why you should come to church every single week. This is why if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you ought to partake of the Lord's Supper every single week and not jut out of here before it happens. Because every single week we are reenacting, we are saying again, this is true. The gospel is true. This is me. This is my identity. And now I'm going to live out of that. That's why we do this. This is not about singing songs and hearing sermons. This is about a reminder. Who are you? Who are you? The second thing, look what he says. Now, if that's true, if you remember your story, now look what Paul does. He says, you need to be ruthless with your sin. Look at verse 5. Put to death, therefore... In light of what I just said, put to death what is earthly in you. What's earthly in me, Paul? Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. By the way, every single one of those is dealing with sexual sin. The Bible takes sexual sin very, very seriously. And I just feel like it bears repeating in a culture like ours that the only sex the Bible approves of is, is sex between one man and one woman within the covenant bond of marriage. Everything else is out of bounds. And Paul says, you put it to death. Now, do you hear this? Paul didn't say, you know, you really ought not to do that. This is radical. This is hostile. This is murderous rage towards your own sin. This is premeditated anger and wrath against the things that are killing you. Paul says, you take, you drag that sin out in the street and you kill it. You put a bullet in its head, you put a stake in its heart, you put a noose around its neck, you bludgeon it to death. Man, that's graphic, Chris. I I don't know, listen, Paul's not mincing words here. Put to death your sin. Like this is, this is, this is radical. You don't mess around with it, right? I mean, is this how you guys, is this how you're dealing with especially your sexual sin? Lust, porn, that relationship that just keeps going too far? Paul says, you take your sin and you kill it. You get rid of it. Because, and, and, and here's the thing. Here, here, here's what happens. We, we so often get kind of, you know, riled up about our sin and we get real serious. And that's good. God wants you to be. And so what do we do? We rush off and we're like, yeah, I'm going to just beat it down, right? And sin goes quiet. And just because it's quiet doesn't mean it's dead. Just because your sin has gone quiet, it might mean it's just nursing itself back to life in your life. Uh, Several years ago, I was flipping through the cable channels, and I don't know what it was. I don't normally do this, but I, I... I saw Ted Nugent. You remember remember Ted Nugent? Anybody? Come on. Jim? Okay, there you go. Yeah. (laughs) Ted Nugent. And he's like a hunter. Who knew that rock and roll Ted Nugent was like this avid hunter? So I'm like, this is weird. So I'm going to watch this for a second. And he goes out and he's hunting bear. So if any of you who are animal rights activists, I'm sorry I close your ears, but here's what happens. He goes out and he's bow hunting. He sits up in a tree, this gigantic black bear, you know, comes lumbering by. He just nails it, right? Immediately the bear goes running off in the woods and he just lies down in a slump. And I'm, Ted Nugent gets out of the tree. He's got this huge gun on his side. And he walks out to the bear and he's like walking slowly and the bear like goes, boom, boom, boom. He like stands back. He shoots it like three times. He walks up a little more. The bear moves. Boom, boom, boom. I'm like, whoa, dude, like you are violent, man. This is crazy what's happening right now, right? Now, that's, that's, that's the right picture. Right? Here's a bear that's wounded. A wounded animal is far more frightening 
than the one that's just sort of roaming free in the woods, right? And you're walking and you're trying to get close to this thing. And here's Ted Nugent going, I'm going to just pop it in the head a few times. Like this thing, I'm I'm putting this thing down. I'm going to be ruthless. I'm going to be angry. There's no way. It's either him or me. And this is us with our sin. Look what John Owen said. I think. One never thinks lust is dead because it is quiet but labors to give it new wounds, new blows every day. This is so good. How many times has sin been revived in our lives because we've not given it new blows every day? We've let it go quiet and thought, hey, we're okay, no problem. We've thought, you know what? I think I've got that under control now. I think that sin, you know what? I can move on. I don't need to think about it. I I, I have managed my sin. Listen, you do not manage sin. You kill it or it kills you. And that's how it works. So we are constantly ruthless about our sin. And one of the reasons we're not ruthless, one of the reasons we don't put it to death is because we frankly kind of like it. It brings us some pleasure at moments. And you don't kill your friends. You don't kill your pets. You shouldn't. I hope you don't, right? You kill your enemies that you know it's either you or them. And so what we have to do is we have to cultivate a hatred for sin. You know how you cultivate a hatred for sin? You remember over and over. You're partaking of the Lord's Supper, and you remember this is his body and blood broken for my sin. You, you, you ask God to give you eyes, not to be judgmental, but to help you see how many, listen, there, not a person in this room doesn't have somebody or some buddies in close proximity to your life that are absolutely being ravaged by sin in the choices they make. Their marriages are falling apart. Their relationships are in the tank. Their careers are going down. Nations are hurting because this politics are screwed up by it. All of this because of sin. That's how you gain. That's how you cultivate a hatred for sin. You will not kill what you do not hate. And so you say, God, help me. I want to I hate this. Because if I love it, I'm, it's never going away, Ever. That's how we cooperate with God. But then look at this other way of cooperating. We name our sin. Look at, look at verses 5 through 10. I'm not going to read them again, but look at what Paul does. Do you notice what Paul doesn't do? Paul didn't say, put these all away. Put to death the fact that, you know, God, aren't we all sinners? We're all sinners. Nobody's perfect. Paul didn't say, put to death, you know, just sort of vague sinfulness and God, I'm broken. God, I'm sinful. Of course you are. How? You know what Paul does? Paul goes, I'm going to name them. Sexual morality, evil desires. God, I have evil desires in my head. There are things that I should not feel that I feel. There are things that I want that I should not want. There are things that I don't want that I should want. Oh God, will you put to death, will you help me by your grace, put that away. You get them out. You know what happens when you name? I mean, you're so honest to stand before God and say, God, I'm a liar. God, I lied today at work. God, I did this. God, I looked at porn. God, I want to be free of this sin. You know what happens is you, in some ways, humiliate yourself to lay that before the Lord. And God says, this is exactly, exactly what I want to help you with. This is exactly where I want to meet you. Right? See, let me say it this way. You will not kill what you cannot name. You won't. I mean, it'll just be says, I'm just kind of sinful. Okay, how? I'm a gossiper. I slandered somebody, God. I had an evil desire. There's sexual morality in my life, and I'm going to name it. I have foul language, God. Clean my mouth. You see what Paul does? I mean, some of these are big. Some of these feel small. Some of us feel like, well, whatever. Oh, so a few bad words slip off my tongue. 
So I get on Facebook and I have some choice things to say. Really? That's not okay with God. And we name them. We name them. But the last thing I want you to see is look at how Paul says we have to feel about sin, right? We have to look at sin from God's perspective. Look at verse 6. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. God hates sin. I didn't say he hates sinners. He hates sin. Now hear me, Christian. At the very bottom of what it means to be a Christian, somebody who claims that Jesus is Lord, somebody who says, God is my Father, I am in this vital, personal relationship with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. At the bottom of that is at the very least a desire to please God. If you are a Christian, you want to please Him. That's not like, oh, I have to. You want to. And so the, the opposite of that is you don't want to incur His wrath. You don't want His wrath being poured out against your sin. You don't want, you, you want you want to know that you're being pleasing to Him. And you want to be pleasing to Him because His wrath was poured out on Jesus Christ. And your sin was nailed to that. And He has taken care of that. See, the reason God hates sin, the reason the wrath of God is being poured out, it's being poured out on the things He hates because it's hurting the ones He loves. And he says, I don't want that. I don't want that for my people. Okay, now, let me just take a few minutes here because I want to, I want to, I want to transition here and say, okay, now, here's, here's what God, here's us cooperating with God. Here's us remembering. Here's us, the, the, the grace of God is now coming into our lives, instructing us, training us to deny these things. And Paul says in verse 8 that one of the things that we're supposed to put away, one of those things that should not be true of a Christian, Colossians 3, 8, is anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. And now notice the progression, by the way. Starts with anger. That's sort of seething inside of you. It, it blasts out of you in wrath. And so often the way anger comes out, can it come out in worse ways like abuse? Absolutely. But so often one of the ways anger comes out is through your mouth, malice, slander, obscene talk. Somebody cut you off in traffic, boom, blah right? And that's how it happens. And Paul says, that must not be. Now, let, let, me, make, let me be clear, because anger is not always a bad thing. We're told in Scripture, be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down in your wrath in Ephesians, right? So, so there is a time. We must be very, very careful, because the Bible also says that the anger of man doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. But there is a good anger. In fact, we just saw it in chapter 3, verse 6. God is angry towards sin. God is a wrathful God. And some of you just repel against that idea like, oh my gosh, no, no, no. He is a God of love, not a God of wrath. Listen, if God is not a God of wrath, He is not a God of love. He cannot be. I mean, look at, if I saw someone abusing my daughter, beating her, and I said, you, I love my daughter, I love her with everything in me. And somebody's beating on my daughter and you're watching this and you're watching me and I'm not doing anything. I'm just sitting there smiling. You're like, what the heck are you doing? Go! I'm not, a, I'm not a father of wrath. I'm a father of love. No, you would say, you're sick. You'd say, there's something wrong with you. You're not loving at all. Because it's your wrath against what's happening that proves that your love is actually real. You want a God of wrath who will come and say, I, I'm a God of wrath because I hate oppression. I hate injustice. And one day I will pour out my wrath because I love justice, because I love free people. 
It's one of the ways we measure love. It's one of the ways we measure what's valuable to somebody. We get angry when somebody hurts something, someone we value, right? And so God's love is always good. Ours, mine, not so much. And you know how you know the difference between righteous anger and unrighteous anger? Ask yourself one question. Would God be angry about what's making me angry? Is this something that God would get angry about? Right? Would, would God get angry at the guy in traffic? Would God get angry at the long line at the grocery store? Would God get angry because you had a hard day and would he kick the dog like you do? Would God get angry because the kids are too loud and he can't watch the football game? You see what I mean? See, because so often all that, all that our anger is is a prideful response to the fact that somebody in my world is not letting me be emperor. You know what I mean by this? I'm driving down the road, somebody cuts me off. Oh, no, you didn't. You know, why? Because you just stepped into my throne room and I control this world of mine and you had no right to do that. I'm in charge here. And you just threatened my self-rule. Now, guess what happens? When somebody does that, I get angry. You get angry. And so how do we respond? We either, we either take our anger and we shove it, shove it, shove it down. And what happens? It turns into bitterness and depression. Or we just let it fly. And it can turn into abuse, physical, emotional, verbal, psychological. Right? We just, we, we, we just all this. And what that anger is showing, both of those responses are showing me, Chris, somebody got knocked off the throne of your life, right? Jesus is supposed to be in that spot and someone, probably you, um, just got knocked off. And this is what's making you angry. You're no longer God of your life. You're realizing you're not in control. And that, boy, that really upsets you, doesn't it? So here's what God's doing. God's letting me see that. See, see, one of the reasons, by the way, let me say it this way. I don't know very many hermits that are angry. You know what I mean by this? If you moved out in the desert by yourself and there was no one out there, I bet you would be like, I am so at peace and I never feel angry. Why? Because there's no one in your life. Because guess Guess where anger comes from, or at least what, where you think it comes from. If I said to you, why are you angry? Because of her, because of him. I'm angry because of my boss. I'm angry because of my roommate. I'm angry because of a teacher. I'm angry because of a wife or a husband. I'm angry because of a child. It's always someone else, isn't it? You understand this? No one makes you angry. All they do is tease out what's inside of there. So if you are one of these hermits, you know what the greatest thing you could do in the process of your sanctification is move to the city and rub shoulders with people. Get a roommate. Invite somebody into your home. I promise you it will tease out anger. Now here's the thing, Christian, the reason God wants us in community, the reason God wants us to have gospel-centered friendships who love Jesus more than they love us is because, man, we collide in those friendships and what happens, friction happens. We begin to sort of feel this angst. We begin to feel like, oh no, something's not right. There's a friction here. I don't like this. And guess what's happening? You're being toppled from the throne. You realize you're not in control. It's making you angry. And here's what most of us will do when we feel that way. If that goes on long enough, we'll start to say things like this. I got to get out. I gotta get out of this marriage, I gotta get out of this job, I gotta get out of this room, this apartment, I've gotta got get out of this class. I have to change so that once again, 
I can hop back up onto the throne of my life and I can be in control. Do you understand that's exactly where Jesus doesn't want you? And that what he's doing is simply this. Chris, I'm knocking you off this throne. Don't run. I just don't run. Because exactly at that point of tension, Chris, exactly at that point of impatience, exactly at that point of anger, this is where I'm saying Here comes the grace-driven effort. Here comes the power of God. If you'll come to me, this is where I want to meet you. I want you to turn away from that anger. But if you run, your heart just goes with you and nothing ever changes. See, you know know what? One of the things I love about being a Christian is that God says change is actually possible. We, 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 can, we can literally, by the power of the Holy Spirit, become different people. God can go to work and I can become more patient than I used to be, more kind than I used to be, less angry, all because of the work of God. And you know what's so wonderful about sanctification? Is that every one of us are doing it. <laughs> which means none of us have arrived, which means nobody can stand there with cape flapping in the wind and act like they've got their act together. And we can all be brave enough now to go, I need help with this. I got a sexual morality problem. I got a lust problem. I'm a gossiper. I want to bring this into the light so the light of Christ. So, so here, so here, and and here, here, here's the thing. When God brings these things to your attention, when God causes that friction in your soul, when God goes, Chris, that anger right there is not producing the righteousness of God. It's not doing it. He's not, he's not showing me that and causing that friction because he's angry at me. You understand this? Like, like it's because he loves me. Like one of the things, just read the Psalms sometimes. I'm I'm astounded how many times God says, or the psalmist says something like this, God, why, why do the wicked prosper? Why am I the one that's feeling all the friction in my life? Because if God doesn't care about you, then guess what he does? Just do what you want. Do what you want. In fact, We could say it this way, the prosperity, biblically speaking, is not always a sign of God's favor. Sometimes it's a sign of his judgment. Because you know what God does? He takes you like Michelangelo, history tells us, took, when he wanted to, to chisel David, he found a a piece of marble, and people say that all he did from that point on was chisel away all the pieces of marble that didn't look like David. This is our sanctification. God's going to love you so much. Chris, I love you how you are right now. I really do. But I love you too much to let you stay that way. And I'm going to start chipping. And it's going to be painful. And it's going to cause friction. Don't run from that. Because you know what I'm going to do? The Bible says now, God says, I'm going to present you faultless. Paul says, I'm going to to present you faultless before his glorious throne. God is chipping, chipping. This is sanctification. I'm doing, cooperate with me. Don't run from this. Listen to me. And let, let's see, you'll begin to see, oh my goodness. And, and now, guess what? Guess what happens? All the things that you hope are true about you, like, like if you read Galatians 5, I'm guessing you want what's in 22, verse 22 and beyond. You don't want on your gravestone sorcerer and <laughs> orgy goer and, right? Nobody wants these. He was faithful. 
He was patient. You want kids that stand up at your funeral. My dad was good. He was kind. Raise the world. This is what God is doing. We don't run from that. We embrace that. Say, God, make us more holy, not less. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you for your goodness, God. Lord, it's unbelievable to think that you would take people like us and begin to chisel away at us and change us into the image of your glorious, beautiful son. And I just pray, God, we wouldn't resist that. I pray, God, we would would resist the lie that says there doesn't need to be any change. Resist the lie that tells us anything like that is legalism. Instead, God, we'd, we'd feel the pull of your Holy Spirit, your Holy Spirit toward holiness, toward making us into the men and women that you want us to be. God, I pray for anybody in this room today that well, they look at their lives and maybe, maybe they thought they were a Christian. God, I'm not here to judge anybody. I don't know if this is true of anyone in this room, but Lord, if they're not, I pray you'd open their eyes. They would say, man, there's no difference between the old me and the new me, so there must not even be a new me. I'm still pursuing the things I pursued. I walked an aisle, I raised a hand, I said some prayer, but there's been no change. God, I pray that that would then spark hope in their heart. They would turn in repentance, place their faith in Jesus, and they would genuinely be saved. The Spirit of God would come to dwell in them, and they begin to walk by the Spirit. And for the rest of us, God, all of us, that we can look at our lives and we can say there's days when we feel like, man, we're walking by the Spirit, and days when we feel like we're failures. I know that's true of me. And I thank you that you're so patient, and you're so kind. And I pray that that kindness and patience would not lead us away from you and would not lead us into a presumptuous lifestyle, God, but it would lead us to repentance. Lead us to a place where we turn and allow the work of the Holy Spirit once more to change us. I love you, God. I thank you and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. Listen. If I just prayed for you, you'd say, Chris, I don't know him. I want to. I mean, you know that's you. I, I, can't, I can't convince you of that, but I don't know why anybody wouldn't want this. I don't know why anybody wouldn't look at the, at the gospel and say, man, I want the power of God at work in my life like that. And if that's you, then I just want you to take this card and fill it out as much as you can. Down here at the bottom it says, I want to be a follower of Jesus. Just, just fill that in and then walk it out to our black info tent outside. We've got some volunteers out there. You don't have to say anything, but this is not our permission to hassle you with dozens of phone calls at all. I mean, it's literally, we just want to help you. We want to help you grow in your relationship with Jesus in any way that we can, okay? And so take that out there and let us pray for you. Let's give you a Bible if you need one, whatever we can do, okay? We're going to spend the rest of our time worshiping the Lord together. We'll sing two more songs. We're going to partake of the Lord's Supper as we do it. And what are we doing? We're remembering what Christ has done. We're remembering our story. We're coming back in and saying, this is true of us. We were dead in our sins. Jesus Christ died from sin. His blood was poured out to pay for my sin. That every Old Testament sacrifice that ever was pointed to this one moment where this would finally take away sin. And we say thank you. And we want to live in that. Now, God, help us live in that. So if you're a follower of Jesus, I invite you to participate. The instructions will be on the screen. And um, and you can partake of that, okay? Like I said, we'll sing two more songs. We'll be on our way. I love you guys. Let's worship the Lord. The 
sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing. His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship your holy name You're rich in love And you're slow to anger Your name is great and your heart is kind for all your goodness i will keep on singing ten thousand reasons for my heart to Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations, from everlasting to everlasting. You are God. So speak to us now as you have spoken to us throughout the generations. Reveal yourself and your will for our lives that we might live as your people. We may seek your face, O oh Lord. Hear our prayer through Jesus, our Lord. Trees and skies. 
skies they sang their songs above you spoke revealing peace long ago the sins of men were paid with blood of bulls and goats he spoke through men the kings the ancient prophets yes you spoke revealing grace so speak to me my heart is open wide for you to come and breathe speak to me I long for words of life your spirit change our eyes just for a minute. Let's close our eyes and and just ask God. I know we just sang it, but let's just ask God purposefully, intentionally to speak to us in this moment. 
to reveal sin to us, to, to show areas of, of, of the growth in our lives. God, we invite you to speak to us. We hear so many other voices every day, our kids' voices, the, our friends, our, our co-workers, and, and God, we want to hear your voice. We ask for your voice to be the, the, the most bold, the, the loudest voice, Lord. God, we can't do any of this without you. All that we've heard this morning about the sanctification, all that we've heard about the work that your Holy Spirit does, we can't do any of this without your help. And Lord, so we pray, we ask that you would do the work, that you would, that you would intercede for us, that you would help us, Lord, on a daily basis, this, even this afternoon as we go out with, with, to lunch and the things that we have planned this week with, with school or, or work, all the things that are ahead of us, Lord. God, help us. God, continue to change us. Continue to make us more like you, more and more holy. God, it's for your glory that we ask this, and not our good. We pray this in your name. Amen. 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 Well, hey, guys, it was great to worship with you this morning. We're so glad you're here with us at Foothill. And uh, just a couple things on your way out. First of all, um, if any of you made a decision to follow Christ today, we'd love to meet you out in the Black Info Tent, uh, support you, give you a Bible, pray with you if, if that's what you need. Also, make sure you stop by and say hi to Daryl McCarthy on the way out. Um, if any of you have interest in his ministry, stop by and say hello. And then finally, if anybody needs prayer, I'll be up front uh, just to pray for your, for your needs. But otherwise, we'll see you guys next Sunday. God bless. See you guys later.